The coronavirus continues to spread around the world, with the total number of confirmed cases now edging towards half a million. The UK continues to be one of the hardest hit countries, and at the time of writing, there have been over 8,000 cases in the UK, with approaching 500 deaths. The real problem for the UK is that these numbers just keep going up, and going up fast. That means the National Health Service, which is already under strain, could end up buckling under the pressure. So in this video, we're going to discuss how the NHS is working to try and handle the crisis and if the health service will be able to cope. Before we get going, I want to let you know that our series, Opinionated, is about to return. Last year we asked you what you thought about a second referendum, foreign aid, burqa bans and weed legislation. For this series, we want to know your thoughts on universal basic income, the cost of university, nuclear power and whether the UK should adopt a written constitution. We have the survey up now, it's linked down below, so tell us what you think and have your views featured in the new series. Also, everyone who completes the survey will get entered into an instant win competition, where everyone wins something, with prizes ranging from discounts in our merch store, to vouchers, to even free badges. So fill out the survey and get your prize now. The National Health Service is a British institution. It's pretty rare for a country's health service to be a serious source of civic pride. But in the UK, many Brits absolutely love the NHS. YouGov polling shows that the majority of Brits approve of the NHS, more than almost any other poll country. And another poll shows that the majority of people are satisfied or very satisfied with the services it offers. However, you'll notice a drop-off in recent years, with the health service receiving its lowest ranking in 11 years. That's at least partly due to the cuts that have been inflicted on the NHS. Cuts which have led people to speculate about the future of the health service, with 51% of people saying they expect care quality to fall, and 50% of people saying they think it's unlikely the NHS will last another 70 years. As I mentioned, the last decade hasn't been kind to the NHS, with stagnating funds and very few increases under the coalition or Cameron administrations. Funding has still continued to increase, but barely enough to keep up with inflation, let alone handle the growing and ageing population. This left the NHS with a £30 billion funding gap in 2013, which the government proposed fixing with a £22 billion worth of savings and an £8 billion government investment, a move which the Nuffield Trust described as the bare minimum needed to maintain existing standards of care for a growing and ageing population going on to say that improving productivity on this scale would be unprecedented. Since entering number 10, Johnson has announced some far more generous funding packages for the NHS, but after 10 years of reduced funding, some healthcare experts doubt the new measures go far enough. Anita Charlesworth, Director of Research and Economics at the Health Foundation, commented that the increases seen in recent years have helped stem further decline in the health service, but it's simply not enough to address the fundamental challenges facing the NHS, or fund essential improvements to services that are flagging. Now today is not the day for us to debate if the Conservatives' austerity measures were correct. I'm sure we can do that in another video. This is simply context to explain that despite Brit's love for the NHS, the service has been struggling for recent years, and as such, some believe its future is uncertain. Then the coronavirus comes along, a major pandemic which is currently shaking the world. For a health service that was already struggling in some areas, a pandemic makes life so much harder. That's because the UK's health service simply isn't equipped to handle a crisis like this. Take one important metric the number of beds available in intensive care units. For those who aren't aware, the intensive care unit, or ICU, handles some of the most serious cases, and their work is vital to keeping people alive. That's because it's the ICU's job to do exactly that, treat those whose lives are at risk or have suffered organ failure. This is obviously important, especially when handling COVID-19, as the most severe cases of coronavirus often lead to lung failure, and the virus can also lead to kidney and cardiovascular failure. Therefore, the ICU doctors and beds available in the units are more important than ever. The problem that Britain has is that there simply aren't enough beds available at the moment. Current data shows that there's only 6.6 .6 ICU beds per 100,000 people in the UK, a number far lower than many other nations. When you look at other European countries, the UK comes in 24th out of 31 nations for ICU beds, 
And the news is even worse when it comes to general hospital beds, where the UK ranks 29th. That's worrying when you consider the UK government has estimated that in the worst case scenario, 80% of Brits could end up being infected by the virus. This would happen over an extended period of time, spreading out these cases, and some say the estimate is too high. So let's do the maths with a set of more optimistic stats. Let's say that about 50% of the population contract COVID-19. That's about 33 million people. The majority of these people would have fairly mild symptoms, with some being entirely asymptomatic. But about 1 in 7 of these people would need to be hospitalised, and that's about 4.8 million people. Of those who are hospitalised, not everyone will need ICU care, only the most severe cases. Even still, about 1 in 5 of those hospitalised patients are expected to be moved to an ICU bed. That's about 950,000 people needing ICU spaces. Those cases obviously wouldn't all come at once, but regardless, the demand for ICU care could very quickly outstrip the supply available within the health service. And that's exactly because of the type of care offered in the ICU. As the name suggests, and as we've alluded to, ICUs handle some of the most severe cases. And as such, patients within the unit require almost constant medical attention. In fact, as one ICU doctor told The Guardian, medical interventions are frequent, invasive, and performed at extremely close proximity. Contact with bodily fluids is inevitable and common. And that constant contact makes handling the coronavirus even more difficult. Unlike most ordinary ICU patients, those with coronavirus, especially the most severe cases, need to be kept isolated. That means not only finding the space to keep thousands of patients individually isolated, but also means the health service needs to protect the staff who come into contact with them. That means that all staff that come into contact with coronavirus patients, from doctors to researchers or cleaners, have to wear personal protective equipment, more commonly known as PPE. At a minimum, PPE is comprised of an especially tightly fitting face mask, a visor, goggles, an extra gown and gloves. This might already sound cumbersome, but it all has to be taken on and off before and after patient contact, and every time it has to be checked over by a colleague. This isn't only a time-consuming and laborious process, it's also proving to be a larger problem for the NHS as a whole. The health service is beginning to run out of vital equipment, putting patients at risk as well as medical staff and their families. Hospitals across the country have reported a lack of PPE, and the concerns became so severe that earlier in the week hundreds of hospitals received overnight shipments from the government. Despite this, many continue to worry about the protection of healthcare professionals. Dr Ranesh Parmar, chair of the Doctors Association UK, said that the longer this epidemic goes on for, if doctors feel there is a widespread lack of personal protective equipment, then some doctors will feel they have no choice but to give up on the profession they love because they feel so abandoned by not being given the PPE that the World Health Organization recommends. When he says that staff aren't being given the PPE recommended by the WHO, that's a slight understatement. The BBC has reported that nurses working in the Royal Free Hospital have been wrapping clinical waste bags around their legs and that staff in North Middlesex Hospital have been forced to tie plastic aprons around their heads. The concern, beyond the direct impact on those staff members, is that if healthcare professionals aren't adequately protected, they're much more likely to contract the virus. This means that they won't be able to work and could end up spreading the virus to their families and the wider community. In fact, Dr Ranesh Parmar went further when talking to Andrew Marr, saying that we've had doctors tell us they feel like lambs to slaughter, they feel like cannon fodder. GPs tell us they feel absolutely abandoned. So what's the plan? How can the NHS continue doing their incredible work, keeping the country protected and saving lives, if they don't have enough capacity, equipment or staff to do so? Well, firstly, the government has essentially written the NHS a blank cheque, allowing them to spend whatever they need to get the crisis under control. This allows for greater levels of spending within the service, helping them invest in equipment where it's available and bringing back retired employees. Secondly, the government's asking 250,000 people to volunteer to support the NHS. As we mentioned in our video on the coronavirus bill, the government has created a new type of leave for regular employees, emergency volunteer leave. This allows people to take time away from their day job to volunteer and help their community deal with the coronavirus. 
With this in place, the government's hoping that a quarter of a million people will come forward to assist with the crisis. Today we launch NHS volunteers. We're seeking a quarter of a million volunteers, people in good health, to help the NHS for shopping and for delivery of medicines and to support those who are shielded to protect their own health. When we launched the appeal last night, we hoped to get 250,000 volunteers over a few days. But I can tell you that in just 24 hours, 405,000 people have responded to the call. Another measure announced by Hancock yesterday was the opening of Nightingale Hospital, a temporary field hospital based out of the XL Exhibition Centre in London. The NHS Nightingale Hospital will comprise two wards, each of 2,000 people. With the help of the military and with NHS clinicians, we will make sure that we have the capacity that we need so that everyone can get the support they need. Finally, Hancock announced that the government has bought 3.5 million antibody tests, tests which could be used by essential workers to check if they've already had the virus. If tests show the person's already had the virus, then the assumption is that they're immune and can return to work. Unfortunately, it's unclear at the moment when these tests will be available though. Ultimately, more than these measures, more than the tests, the volunteers, the new hospitals, the most important thing people can do is continue following the government's social distancing advice. But no matter how big we grow the NHS, unless we slow the spread of this virus, then as we've seen, those numbers will continue to rise. And that's why it's so important that everybody follows the advice and stays at home. So please continue following the government's advice and make life as easy as possible for healthcare workers by limiting the spread of the virus. And to the essential staff working in the NHS, working in logistics, working in supermarkets, working across the whole economy, thank you for your incredible efforts. This is clearly a challenging time and the NHS may be shaken to its core, but we're all reliant on and incredibly appreciative of your hard work. So thank you. If you want more updates on the coronavirus crisis as it plays out, be sure to subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to be notified every time we release a video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible.